today's passage from the book of Revelation, chapter 3, verses 14 through 22. <coughs> Revelation 3, 14 through 22. To the angel in the church of Laodicea, write, These are the words of the Amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. I know your deeds, that you are neither cold nor hot. I wish you were either one or the other. So because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire, so you can become rich, and white clothes to wear, so you can cover your shameful nakedness, and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. Those whom I love I rebuke and discipline, so be earnest and repent. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come in and eat with him, and he with me. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne, just as I overcame and sat down with my Father on his throne. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. So there are some commercials out right now. I, I think they're for like a phone or something. But the central hook of these commercials is to be just okay is not okay. Now I could play a couple of these commercials up on the screen for you, but you know, what's the fun of that? <laughs> Instead, I've invited a few of our high school students to help me recreate these for you right now. So I'm going to ask the students to come on up and to do your thing. We're okay. Yes. Okay? Well, we've got a saying here. If the brakes don't stop it, something will. That's not a real saying. Oh, well, it is around here. I wrote it. <laughs> We're okay at this. First tattoo? Yep. Relax, amigo. It's going to look okay. Just okay? No worries, boss. I'm one of the tattoo artists in the city. You mean one of the best tattoo artists in the city? Mm, something like that. Aren't you supposed to draw it first? Stay in lane, bro. I'm okay at this. <laughs> Have you ever worked with Dr. Francis? Oh, yeah. He's okay. Just okay? Guess who just got reinstated? <laughs> Are you nervous? Yeah. Me too, but don't worry. We'll figure this out. I'll see you in there. I'm okay at this. <laughs> Thank you, guys. We do this because today we're going to look at the last letter in the book of Revelation, the letter to the church in Laodicea. And the church in Laodicea was okay. Now, they weren't good, they weren't bad, they were just okay. There wasn't any big <laughs> sin in this church. They weren't hypocrites. They weren't tolerating a Balaam or a Jezebel leading the people away. They hadn't lost sight of their first love. They weren't really doing anything wrong. They just weren't doing anything right either. They were just okay. Jesus says they are lukewarm. They're not hot or cold. They're they're just okay. I think this comes down to the idea that they lacked passion for the Lord. Webster's Dictionary defines passion as a driving or overmastering emotion or conviction. And that's not an accurate definition. It's pretty good, but I think it lacks heart. Passion is what drives us. Passion is what energizes life. Passion is what gets us out of bed in the morning saying, I'm going to do something with my life today. Passion is what causes explorers to boldly go where no one has ever gone before. It's what keeps scientists up late at night trying to discover cures for deadly diseases. It's what causes songwriters to put words to music 
Passion is what turns someone who can draw into an artist. And passion is what was lacking in the church of Laodicea. They were okay. Jesus said they were lukewarm. He was using a food analogy here. That is, there's not many foods we eat that are lukewarm. Uh, imagine a piping hot steak that's no longer hot. Imagine a ice cold drink that's now barely cool. A fresh apple pie that's not fresh anymore. A bowl of ice cream that's melted to the point that the soup that's left isn't even cold. Not an appetizing meal. Jesus, Jesus said in the same way this church in Laodicea was lukewarm. They had no passion for life. And Jesus called them to recapture that passion. C.S. Lewis once said, the only thing Christianity cannot be is moderately important. But this church in Laodicea, they had no passion. They were just okay. How often does that happen in the church in America today? Where people lack passion. And the thing is, we want passion. We desire that as a culture. We look for passion in life. I found many people don't even care what they're passionate about. They just desire passion. They want to feel alive. This week I got on Google to look up books about passion. And there's a book about passion for everything. A passion for nature. A passion for Paris. A passion for baking. I found eight different books, all with different authors, all entitled A Passion for Needlework. <laughs> we want passion. There are literally hundreds of books about how to discover your passion in life and more than 100 million Websites and articles devoted to discovering your passion. We desire passion in life. And yet somehow, so many people never find that passion. Why not? What holds us back from passion in life? But today I want to talk about two things that destroy our passion, and then I'll talk about how we can rediscover passion for the Lord. The first thing that destroys passion in life is a love of stuff. The fancy word for this is materialism. To care about physical things, to love money. And this seems to be the big problem in the Church of Laodicea. They loved stuff. They said, I am rich, I have acquired wealth, and I need nothing. They we're a wealthy church. They were in a wealthy city. These are the people who had the three-story house. They had the designer clothes. They bought a timeshare and didn't even worry about the maintenance fees. They had the, the church with three sanctuaries and a gym and a spa and an Olympic pipe-sized pool out and back. They were rich. But it was all a facade. It was just a covering. Jesus said that underneath this material wealth, they were in spiritual poverty. He said that they were poor, wretched, blind, and naked. They had created this external wealth that left them spiritually poor. I think church in America knows what that is like. We know what it is like to be comfortable with our wealth, but it can deny us of our passion for the Lord. Because materialism, a love of stuff, a love of money is never going to create passion. Paul wrote in the book of 1 Timothy, the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. I know Paul didn't say that money itself is evil. Money, having money or not having money is not good or bad. But the love of money destroys our passion for the Lord. It drives us away from God. The love of money can create greed, which is sort of like a mirror image 
of passion. That is, it looks the same, but everything's reversed. It's a cool two-dimensional fake. If passion heats us up, then greed makes us cold. If passion brightens life, then greed darkens it. Because greed and materialism is all about physical stuff. Physical stuff has no soul. It can't produce passion in our lives. I'm sure you've all heard the old cliche. He who dies with the most toys wins. Got two responses for that. First, he who dies with the most toys still dies. <laughs> but beyond that, he who dies with the most toys may never have lived. It is far more likely that his love of those toys destroyed his passion for life. Dying with the most toys does not mean that someone lived a full and passionate life. The love of stuff, the love of money, destroys passion for the Lord. So first, materialism will destroy our passion for the Lord. A second thing to watch out for is that distractions destroy our passion for the Lord. It's very similar to what I just talked about. There are things that pull us away from God. In Laodicea, it was money that pulled people away from God. It distracted them from a passion for the Lord. Of course, we know that money is not the only distraction out there. There are many other things that can pull us away from God. An unbalanced life distracts us from passion. I recently read a study from the University of Pennsylvania that said that about half of Americans are overworked. We struggle to find balance between work and rest. And that doesn't really surprise me. I've known a lot of people who always seem to be busy. What did surprise me is that while half of Americans are overworked, the other half are underworked. They haven't found balance. They rather, they've found that they're not doing enough, and they feel like they're wasting their lives. We struggle to find a balance between work and rest. And if we don't have that balance, then passion's a pipe dream. An unbalanced life will distract us from passion to the Lord. Unresolved conflict distracts us from passion for the Lord. Have you ever had a day where you got up and you were just ready to go? And you're, yeah bounce out of bed, you're walking on air, you take your shower, eat your breakfast, you're ready to face the day. And as you make it to the door, you manage to get into a little fight with your spouse. You're not a big thing, just a silly little thing. But it's like air just going out of a balloon. The, the, the passion for the day is gone, and you just trudge out the door, dreading facing the day. And that's just from a little spat with your husband or wife. I've known people who have spent years in conflict with another person. Whenever they think about that other person, they get upset. Whenever they drive past that person's house, they get mad. That draws the passion out of their lives. It drains them of any passion for the Lord. And if they're ever going to find that passion, they need to resolve the conflict. Even if the other person is 100% in the wrong, as long as they let that conflict go, they'll never find passion in their lives. Unresolved conflict distracts us from passion. Unconfessed sin distracts us from passion. And this can be a big one. Nothing drains us of joy and love and passion like guilt. If we have an unconfessed sin in our lives, it drains the passion right out of us. Shame is lethal to enthusiasm. Guilt destroys passion. These are things that take us away from passion. And if we want to have passion in our lives, the first step is to remove the things that destroy passion. Okay, but let's assume you've done that. Let's assume that you are actively working against the materialism of this age. Assume that you have 
sought to resolve any conflict, that you're looking for balance in your life, that you have confessed any sins and are seeking forgiveness. So what now? I mean, passion isn't something that's just going to happen in life. Like nearly everything else in life, it needs to be cultivated. So how do we cultivate passion? Maybe you don't need that. Maybe right now in your life you feel a passion for the Lord. If so, wonderful. The rest of this sermon's not really for you. But if not, if you still feel that you lack passion, there are ways that we can seek passion. Now, first, I'm going to assume that you are already in regular prayer and Bible study. If not, if you're not in daily prayer, if you're not in the word daily, then you already know why you don't have passion in your life. You're unplugged from God. If I, I can switch a lamp on and off a million times, if it's not plugged in, there's no power and the light's not turning on. If we're not regularly in prayer with the Lord, then we're unplugged from God and we're never going to have passion. So I'm going to assume you're already there, that you are seeking God in prayer. Well, Jesus tells us how we can then have passion. He says it to the church in Laodicea. He says, you should buy from me gold refined by fire so that you'll be rich, and white clothes so that you can cover your nakedness. Jesus tells the church in Laodicea to turn to him to receive passion. That's still true for us today. If we desire passion in the Lord, it starts there. We ask God to grant us that passion. We turn to him directly and we pray for that passion. And we go beyond that. For centuries, Christians have sought to be more than just lukewarm in the, in the Lord. So learn from them. A few weeks ago, I talked about the Christian discipline of meditation when it comes to recapturing our first love in the Lord. I'd also encourage meditation for recapturing passion in God. I know, in our world today, meditation gets a bad name. Because the world has kind of ruined it. The world has no idea what meditation is. It's created this faux meditation, this empty and false thing. The world thinks that if you cross your legs and go, mm, for a long period of time, then you're meditating. That's not true. Genuine Christian meditation is nothing like that. The goal of meditation is not to be emptied, it's to be filled. We meditate on the Lord so that we can be filled with his love and his peace and his passion. We don't empty our thoughts, we focus our thoughts. We focus on a passage in the Bible, we focus on what God has created, we focus on our experience of the Lord. We can also meditate on an aspect of God. We can meditate on his passionate love because God loves you passionately. He cares for you and he desires for you to know him. In the book of John, Jesus said, there's no greater love than this. And the man laid down his life for his friends. If you want to know the passion for the Lord, meditate on how he has shown his love to you. Take time to meditate on the lengths that Christ has gone to to show you his love. And I'll recommend a second discipline that I think is largely forgotten in this world. The discipline of simplicity. Simplicity is actively choosing to get rid of the things that clutter our lives. It starts with physical things. Is looking at physical things and asking, is this something I need, or is this just taking up space in my life? And from there, <coughs> it goes on to less physical things. It's looking at how I use my time and asking, am I building passion or am I distracting from passion? If you lack passion in your life, I would recommend taking the next month to keep a chart of how you spend your time. So we write down what it is you do with your time each day. And at the end of that month, look back at that chart. Look at how you are spending your time. And for each chunk of time, ask, is this something 
building passion, or is this something distracting from passion? Now, to be clear, I'm not saying you need to work hard. I think there are probably a few people in this room that work too hard already. But when we recognize how we are using our time, we can seek balance in our time. When we can achieve that balance, the discipline of simplicity, of asking, is the way I'm using my time, is the way I'm using my life building passion or destroying passion? And once we start to have that first bit of passion, it leads to more. It leads to other disciplines like solitude and fasting, which help us detach from the things that we pretend are important but really aren't. And that can lead to worship and celebration, which fill us with the joy of the Lord and increase the passion we have for Him all the more. We live in a society that wants passion. And the only thing Christianity cannot be is moderately important. If you desire passion in your life. If you don't have it and that's what you want, there's a God who desires for you to have that passion, who desires for you to know him and live in that passion. And when we have a passion for the Lord, it builds passion in every area of life. So if you desire passion in God, it is available to you. The moment we're going to stand for our invitation here. And as we stand to seeing if you're looking at your life and saying it would be described as anything but passion. You desire to see a change. You desire a passion for the Lord. He is here waiting for you to turn to Him. As you'll stand with me now for invitation Him, which is just as I am, and we'll sing all the verses. <laughs>